So the two most common type of infections are certainly Lyme disease and syphilis. Um, leptospirosis is not a very common affliction in humans per se, and um, it's, uh, but the two most common are Lyme, Borreliosis, and uh, uh, syphilis. And the interesting thing is that both um, are great masqueraders uh, in terms of the symptoms that they can cause, um, and they can mimic other conditions and throw people off. Um, and the uh, Lyme, Lyme disease can range in terms of pain for anything from joint pain to localized arthritis, more general arthritis, uh, uh, joint pain to more um, arthritic-like complaints to uh, headache and frank meningitis, radicular pain, neuropathies, facial pain, um, each of which can become acute or chronic. Uh, in post-Lyme disease, there's a very interesting and some, I guess, tragic phenomenon where people who are treated uh, and seemingly appropriately treated with antibiotics continue to have symptoms that seem to be referable to their original Lyme infection, but they're not associated with active Lyme. And so there's a controversy over what's fueling that, and they're not necessarily responsive to additional antibiotics. Um, and there's some interesting ideas about immune system activation and how that may play a role. Uh, syphilis is um, painful most commonly um, in if, if, it, if there's a meningeal um, involvement and also um, later in its course um, if this spinal cord is, it comes involved in tabus dorsalis. Um, but it's not nearly as associated with pain as would be Lyme disease. Uh, but Alan Steer is a rheumatologist who is who did a lot of the initial work while he was at, when he was at, um, at Yale University, and it's called Lyme disease because of children who at in Old Lyme, Connecticut, who with an incredible uh, um, prevalent uh, uh, incidence, much more so than expected, would de had developed symptoms consistent with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, and they were being brought to Yale, to, ultimately to Yale subspecialty clinics, and. Um, what I'm under the impression of is that Dr. Steer was a rheumatology fellow at the time, and he was assigned as a project, or a young attending, and was assigned a project to kind of figure it out. And so the first discoveries in Lyme disease were in a rheumatologic setting. Across Long Island Sound, on Long Island, uh, at Stony Brook and other places, it became clear that all of a sudden people were um, uh, having meningitis and radiculitis and even um, cardiac, heart block and other conditions, uh, Bell's palsy, a very common presentation. And these were associated with the Lyme spirochete. And so it became clear with a lot of work, um, basic and clinical scientists on Long Island and, and other places and Ray Datweiler, John Halpern at Stony Brook, that this was more of a, that, that Lyme actually invaded the nervous system early and was more of a neurological disorder than, or it was more prominently a neurological disorder than a rheumatologic disorder. If you don't check, you don't know. Um, and so if a person doesn't present in a characteristic way and they may, they may not be screened or the assay that was used may not have been appropriate, but we commonly see people who have gone untreated still. If it's believed to be associated using serological techniques, so if we believe that it's um, systemic Lyme, then there are blood tests. If we think that a person has neuroLyme, um, then you need to show specific intraspinal, intrathecal production of antibody to Lyme, and that's done through a spinal tap. These days, spinal taps can be done under fluoroscopic guidance with sedation, uh, with uh, you know, there's a needle, a special, so this, this spinal needle causes its issues sometimes because of the way it shears the covering, the meninges. Mm -hmm. And so there's a needle, special needle called a Gertie needle, that's G-E-R-T-I-E, -E, that has a blunt um, tip so that it, shear, it doesn't shear the meninges but the same way, in the same way so the post-lumbar puncture symptoms are less. We, we offer people the opportunity to have a spinal tap if needed uh, in a non-urgent setting. Uh, under x-ray or fl fluoroscopic guidance sedated so that they don't feel anything because they'll be numbed lo with local anesthetic, they'll, they'll be in a twilight zone and they won't know that ha whatever happened to them. 
um, and we do, I do all the smile clips that I do, I do in an outpatient ambulatory kind of setting so I can watch people afterwards for several hours and make sure that they're hydrated and comfortable before they go home. Of course, if you're in the emergency room and you're worried about meningitis acutely, you'll do whatever you gotta do. 